ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرساله وادى الامانه ونصح الامه وجاهد في الله تعالى حق الجهاد حتى اتاه اليقين فصلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه ومن تمسك بهديه واقتفى اثره الى يوم الدين اما بعد فان اصدق الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل بدعه ضلاله Indeed, our praises are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah with our partner. We know this and we believe this. And we actualize this and perform this with our tongues. We mention Allah's beautiful names, His perfect attributes, and His peerless qualities. We praise Allah azza wa jalla in the morning, in the noon time, afternoon time, in the evening, and in the twilight. We praise Allah azza wa jalla before we sleep, when we wake up, before we eat, after we eat. Everything that we do is a means of praising Allah Azza wa Jal and lauding Him Subhanahu wa Ta'ala Wallahu alhamdu Allah says that He has alhamd He has the praise fil ula In this life and in the next life We ask Allah Azza wa Jal for help We ask Him for assistance We ask Him for pardon We ask Him to overlook our shortcomings And to hide our mistakes and our faults We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to keep us safe from the consequences of our negative elements that are contained in our own souls those elements and those souls that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows more about than we do ourselves Allah azza knows more about our nufus our souls more than we do and we feel that we are attached and connected to our nufus and that the nafs is close by and is intertwined with the physical matter but Allah Azza wa Jalla, Rabbukum Alamu Bima Fi Nufusikum. Allah truly knows what's in the heart, and Allah truly knows what is in the breasts of men, and Allah who Subhanahu wa Taala truly knows the nature of this ruh, the nature of this soul. Those who are guided, it is only because Allah who Subhanahu wa Taala has chosen to make them guided, and those who are misled, it is only because Allah Azza wa Jalla knew that they weren't good for guidance, they were unsuited for Islam. They were unsuited for this beautiful gift, and he chose not to hand it to them. I bear witness and I testify that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, along with our partner, is the one who deserves to be worshipped. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is the apostle of Allah, the messenger of Allah. He is the bearer of glad tidings. He is the plain, naked warner. And al Bashir al Nadir. He says, An al Nadir al Uriyan. He says, I am the plain naked warner. As the Prophet ﷺ has told us when he spoke to his companions, Sabahakum wa masakum. He says, the enemy has captured you. You're laid under siege. It's too late. Don't seek help. Don't fight back. It's too late. And the Arabs from their customs is that whenever there was someone in the watchtower, a lookout for a raiding army, and he found that that raiding army had came too close within the walls of the citadel or the encampment. He would take off his clothes and he would stand and he would be naked. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ says, I'm a plain warner. There's nothing left. And the last day, the last hour, too close. So get your act together right now before death comes to you and only Allah knows how long this worldly life will exist only Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how many years you have left in your qiyamah in your last day quote unquote kullu man mata faqad qamat qiyamatu as shaykh al-islam ibn taymiyyah said anyone who dies then his last day quote unquote has been established and the ultimate last day is when everyone will be resurrected and stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ For a tremendous day, a day of which you've never thought of. You can't imagine and you can't ponder. As Aisha radhi Allah ta'ala asked the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam when he told her that the people will be resurrected, they will have no clothes on, they will have no shoes on, they will be uncircumcised. She says, well how about the men and the women that can't about the humfi 
Won't men look at women? Won't women look at men? He says, La ya bint al Sadiq in al Amra ashadim in thalika. He says that's the last thing on the people's minds, looking at the opposite sex. That's the last thing on their minds. They're not thinking about that anymore. And they see the fire in front of them in plain view. And that's the only concern that they will have on that day. Not their wealth, not their children. Allah Azza wa he tells us that every woman who's breastfeeding will neglect and abandon her baby. Can you think about this? Can you ponder this? That is the most unfathomable idea for a woman who's breastfeeding. She may forget her phone, her car keys, her wallet. She may lose this, she may have, but never ever her suckling baby. That's impossible. That doesn't come across her mind, her young child. And on that day, that is exactly what will take place. So prepare yourselves for this day. And the Prophet والسلام, he has done his job. He's the Nadir al Aryan. He's the plain naked warner. He gave you the last final warning to get your act together. May the prayers be sent upon him. May his name be mentioned in the company of the highest angels. May all of his wives and his children and his Ahlul Bayt, may Allah be pleased with them all. His companions who believed in him, who sacrificed, who gave all that they had, who sacrificed and suffered and went through so much. May Allah Azza be pleased with them as well. And all of the Muslims who follow his way, who adopt his path, and who tread his method of da'wah and his method of propagating Islam until the last day to proceed. The most excellent speech is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the most excellent guidance is the guidance of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam, a sunnah sahiha, the authentic sunnah. And the worst thing is to take something which is perfect, something which is a masterpiece, and add something to it, and take something from it, and augment it, and twist it, and tweak it, and adjust it, and make your own interpretation, and your own understanding, and your own mixture of Islam, of culture, and this and that, and you dip and you dab. And then you say, I have a good intention, Allah is forgiven, it's nothing wrong with making this act of worship. It's nothing wrong with saying this or doing this. What's the problem? Will Allah Azza wa punish me? As the man asked Muhammad ibn Sidin, he was sitting in the masjid and he was making dhikr in a certain way in which the Prophet never made dhikr. And he was doing it in a specific manner in which the Prophet never ever made that dhikr. And he said to him, stop. Stop making this bid'ah. He says, are you adhibin illahu ala dhikr? He says, will Allah punish me for making dhikr of Allah? He says, La, well, can you bid'ah? But he'll punish you for making things up in the religion of Al-Islam. That's what Allah will punish you for. Allah will not punish you for mentioning his name. Allah will not punish you for doing what you're supposed to do of righteousness and piety. But Allah will punish you for disrespecting him. Allah asked the rhetorical question: Do they have partners with me? Do I have a second, a third, a fourth? Is there another one like me? Who has legislated and laid down what Allah has not allowed? Allah asked this question. Who can answer this question on Yom Al Qiyamah? So Allah Azza will punish the slave for ugliness. And the greatest ugliness is to take beauty and perfection and alter it and change it. And that's what bid'ah is in Al Islam. So each and every bid'ah is a misguidance, and we know that the misguidance is no is in no place. It has no location except in the fire of hell. Wa other billah. To proceed, my dear brothers and sisters in Al-Islam, the speech that I want to share with you today, or the reminder, or the message, is by me starting off asking you a question, or bringing up a question, a tasa'ul, as we say. If I were to ask you, what is the purpose of fasting? What is the main wisdom of fasting? Inshallah ta'ala, most of you would say it's taqwa. It's to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's to be righteous, it's to be pious, it's to be God-fearing. Allah says, Ya ayyuhu alladhina amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyam kema kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'alakum tatakun ayyaman ma'adudat. Allah says, O you who believe, fasting is obligatory upon you. Just like it was obligatory upon those who came before you, for you to have taqwa. And this is a correct answer, but it's only partially correct. And there's another major higher aim, another major higher aim of fasting from the maqasid of siyam al uzma and this is something which is found in another ayah of the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these ayat that i'm going to recite to you have nothing to do with fasting they were not sent down concerning fasting they were not sent down in the month of shaban or ramadan or shawal they were not 
related directly to anything pertaining to fasting inside or outside of the month of Ramadan. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, telling us one of the greatest secrets and one of the biggest wisdoms of fasting. Allah says, if there are two groups of believers, if there are two factions, two parties of Muslims, and for one reason or another, they fight, they cannot agree, they differ, they bicker, they argue, and it becomes so heated and so inflated that they pick up arms and there is physical combat. Allah says, When Then stop them. Tell them to put down your weapons. Don't fight each other. There's no need for violence. Allah Azawajal, He says, and if one party refuses except to be the aggressor, refuses except to continue to fight obstinately and transgress the boundaries, you Muslims have a new responsibility. You have a new duty. And that responsibility is no longer making islah verbally. It's no longer talking peacefully, but now you have to physically fight the aggressive party. You have to physically fight the people that are going against the way of peace and armistice. You now have to physically stop your brother from harming his other brothers. As the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Unsur akhaka, dhaliman aw mazluman. How about your brother, if your brother is a wrongdoer, if your brother is a bad guy, or if your brother is being wronged, and if your brother is a good guy? Obviously the campaigns, they said, we all know about the mazlum, Messenger of Allah. That's common sense. If our Muslim brother is being wronged and oppressed, to help him out. That's clear. But we don't yet understand how to help the volume. Kaif, how do we help the volume? He says, Umnahu, uhjuzhu an dhulmihi. He says, stop him from making his oppression. Force him to put his hands down. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيعَ إِلَىٰ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ Until they return back to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is peace. Peace and no unnecessary violence. Allah Azza wa Jal, He then says, فَإِنْ فَاءَتْ فَأَصْلِهُ بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَأَقْسِطُوا إِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الْمُقْسِطِينَ So if they stop, if they come back to their righteousness, to their rushed, if they use common sense and logic, there's no need to fight. We can reach a peaceful settlement for aslihu baynahuma bil adl. Then use justice, use justice and fairness to settle the problem, not with injustice, not with wrongdoing. You cannot take my land, take my house, take my property, take my honor, take my wealth, kill me and slaughter me, and then say, I'm to make peace with you. Give me back my property. Give me back the reparations that you took from me. You damaged me. There can never be peace without justice in Islam or outside of Islam. Allah Azza wa He says, Bil adl wa aqsitu. And make sure that you have equity. Be just. Be fair. Don't be too weak. Don't be excessive. Be right in the middle. In the Allah yuhibu al muqsitin. Because Allah Azza wa He loves the peacemakers. Allah loves people who are just, who are honest, and people who are fair. Most importantly, last but not least, Allah says, He says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Allah says the believers are nothing more. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ The only thing that the Muslims are, not neighbors, not friends, not employers and employees, not people from the same ancestry, the same genealogy, the same tribe, the same country, the same family, friends, buddies, and associates. The believers are nothing more than brothers. They're brethren. So help them behave like brothers towards each other. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, and fear Allah, because perhaps you may get a little bit of Allah's mercy. So this ayah, it shows us a divine connection, brothers and sisters. And this divine connection is brotherhood and taqwa. Taqwa and brotherhood. They go hand in hand. And this is one of the most important reasons behind us fasting. Now you're asking, how is this? We understand with regards to brothers and stopping violence and stopping aggression and stopping oppression. But what does this have to do with fasting now? Brotherhood and taqwa and sometimes the brotherhood being more important than taqwa and fasting. 
The answer is found in the hadith of Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari in which he said, Tasahharu fa inna fi sahuri barakatan. He said, Eat suhoor, because in doing so is barakah. Take the morning meal before you fast, even if you're strong enough to fast without it. Even though it's at 5 a.m., 4.30 a.m., 4 a.m., and the sun doesn't set until 8.30 p.m., 9 p.m. What's the purpose of me drinking a cup of water and a few dates and raisins early in the morning? Allah says there is a barakah. The Prophet says it's the barakah. And from this barakah, the people of knowledge, they say, is that it gets you to give sadaqah to help people out, to look for the poor people that cannot afford suhoor. When you're up early in the morning, you have the ability to share the sufra, share the ma'idah. And this is from the greatest wisdoms of fasting, is that it instills brotherhood. Have you thought about your brother who's always hungry? Have you thought about your brother who's always thirsty? Have you thought about your brother who cannot afford to get married? He has no beautiful wife in which he has to refrain from and avoid and stay away from until it's the sunset. Have you thought about your brothers and sisters who are poor and starving, who are being bombed, and you give them some money to send them band-aids? Did you think about your brother and how hungry he is, and how diseased he is, and how malnutrition and malnourished and famine these Muslims are. This is from the wisdoms of fasting. So the next time you have a stomach pain, the next time your head is aching, it's hurting, the next time your mouth is dry, perhaps you can reflect upon those poor Muslims who are being killed, who are being murdered, who are starving, who don't have no food to eat who don't have no drinks to drink. And this be the night title will increase your compassion and your sympathy for those Muslims all around the rest of the year. In Sha'ban, in Shawwal, before and after Ramadan. So brotherhood, al-ukhuwa, and taqwa, and fasting, they all go round and round. It's like one triangle. There's taqwa, there's siyam, there's brotherhood. It's siyam, this is brotherhood, and it's taqwa. This is from the greatest wisdoms of fasting is for you to be a good brother and a good sister and for you to be compassionate and for you to be sympathetic and for you to have some type of heart for those who are less fortunate than you. So what are you going to do? Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatullahi wa salamu ala ibadih ladhin asqafa amabat. فقد روى الإمام أحمد في مسنده والنسائي في سننه بسند صحيح من حديث رجاء بن حيوة عن أبي أمامة الباهلي رضي الله تعالى عنه أنه كان مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في غزوة من الغزوات قال فقلت يا رسول الله مرني بأمر آخذه عنك وينفعني الله به فقال رسول الله عليه الصلاة والسلام عليك بالصوم فإنه لا مثل له وفي رواية عليك بالصيام فإنه لا عدل له وفي رواية أخرى فأتيته مرة ثانية فقال عليك بالصيام أنه قال في المرة الأولى مرني بأمر يدخلني الجنة فقال عليك بالصيام ثم أتيته ثانية فقال عليك بالصيام فإنه لا مثل له أبو أمام الباهلي رضي الله عنه has narrated and the Muslim Ibn Muhammad and the Sunan of Imam al Nasai, an authentic narration, he says that one day I was with the Messenger of Allah والسلام, and we were on a military expedition. We were out fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for one reason or another, I went to the Prophet والسلام, and I asked him for some advice. And it's a very longer story, but we want to give you the summarized version of this story. A very long story of this experience that he had with the Prophet والسلام, directly. And we know that the Messenger of Allah was kind, he was courteous, he was gentle, and most importantly, he was humble. What leader do you have direct access to? How many stories do you have in which there is a normal, quote-unquote, peasant soldier, a private, someone in the lowest ranks of the army that can have the direct contact with the highest leader in the army? That was the Messenger of Allah that's what type of leader he was. He had no guards. There was no secretary. There was no line that you had to wait in. There was no number. There was no comeback the next day, in the third day, in the fourth day. There was none of that. 
If you wanted something, if you needed something, the companions had access to the Messenger of Allah So he went to the Prophet and he asked the Prophet for certain things. And from the things that he asked him for, he said, Murni bi'amrin. He says, please give me something, O Messenger of Allah. Give me some advice. Give me some advice which is practical, which is beneficial, that's directly from you. That Allah will allow me to benefit from. That Allah will benefit my soul, my body, and my mind from your special advice. I don't want advice from Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. I don't want advice from Umar al-Khattab. I don't want advice from none of the other companions. He says, Murni bi amrin akhudhu anka. Give me advice directly from you. So the Prophet والسلام, he honored the request of his companion. And look how short, how simple, how easy, how sweet and concise his words were. He did not give him a paragraph, a story, a lecture, a sermon. He said, Alayka bis siyam, Alayka bis sawm. He says, fast. Stick to fasting. Adhere to fasting. Make sure that you always fast. Why, O Messenger of Allah? Are we fighting? Are we in a battle? Why should I give sadaqah? Why should I not pray at night? Why should I not seek knowledge? Why fasting? He says, فَإِنَّهُ لَا مِثْلَ لَهُ He says, because there's nothing like fasting. There's nothing comparable to fasting. There's no act of worship that can rival fasting. Raja ibn Haywa, the sub-narrator, he said after this hadith, فَمَا رُؤِيَ أَبُوْ أُمَامَةَ وَلَا مْرَأَتُهُ وَلَا خَادِمُهُ إِلَّا صِيَامًا After Abu Humama heard this narration, no one ever saw Abu Humama or his wife or any of his servants except that all of them were fasting. Once he got the advice from the Prophet Sallallahu he didn't just write it down, he didn't just store it, he didn't just say, Wallahi, that's Jameel. He implemented that advice. And he implemented it and enforced it on his family and anyone that he had an authority over in his household. So every time they saw him, his wife, or one of his servants, all of them were fasting. Rajab and Haywa, he then says, Qala fakana idha ruya. He says, so when, he says after that, Whenever we saw a fire in his house or in his home, we knew that he had a guest or there was a special occasion. There was never any cooking in the daytime after Abu Umamah heard that hadith because he realized what it meant and he realized how special it was. He says, fast because there's nothing like fasting. Stick to fasting. Be someone who fasts because there's nothing like it. Now you may ask, how is this? How is there anything like fasting? First and foremost is this hadith teaches us the importance and the virtue and the superiority of making an abundance of fasting. Fasting which is mandatory. Fasting which is recommended. Making up days of fasting. It's an excellent, beautiful thing to do. Nothing can come close to the effect of fasting upon the purification of the soul, upon the purification of one's mind, upon the purification of your eyes, upon your health, your strength, your self-discipline, your self-control, upon you being sympathetic for your brother and not just starving and being hungry for half of the day for 30 days. But I fast in the six days of Shawwal. I fast Mondays and Thursdays. I fast the three white nights. I fast three days from each and every single month. I fast the day of Arafah, this day, that day, etc. He says, fast because there's nothing similar to fasting. وانقمعت شهواته وانقلعت مواد الذنوب من أصلها ودخل في الخير من كل وجه وأحاطت به الحسنات من كل جهة انتهى كلامه رحمه الله He says regarding this hadith the reason why fasting is so excellent it's so matchless it's so peerless there's nothing that's like it as the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام has narrated to us that Every single deed that the children of Adam perform is nothing more than for the children of Adam. Allah Azza He says, except for fasting, because fasting is for me, and I myself give the reward for fasting. Before we read this speech, how does this hadith make any sense? The hadith says 
that all of the deeds of the sons of Adam are for the sons of Adam except for fasting because it's for me and I give the reward when you pray who do you pray towards do you not pray towards Allah do you not make a sincere intention for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who rewards you for making salah except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what does this hadith mean just stop and think and ponder if there was a wealthy man a powerful man an extremely influential man who had a very large huge mansion the finest of the fine and he says I'm going to throw a grand banquet the most exquisite luxurious banquet the best chefs the best food the best of the best and I myself am inviting you I myself will meet you at the gate I myself will serve you I myself will bring you the tray I myself will entertain you I myself you'll be a personal guest of me not of the state not of the city not of the property you're my personal guest and I'm going to look after you when I send you a car I'll be the one who's driving it has a deeper meaning now doesn't it and if you go to that rich mansion he's the one who paid for your food he's the one who has furnished and entertained you as his guest but it isn't the same if you never see him it isn't the same if he himself doesn't declare I'm looking after your expenses so it says Allah says fasting is for me and I give the reward for it who gives the reward besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nobody but fasting is so special that Allah Azawajal gives a special reward and he makes sure that those who fast get the reward in full so Al-Munabi rahimahullah ta'ala he says this hadith means إِذْ هُوَ يُقَوِّ الْقَلْبَ وَالْفِطْنَ he says fasting is so special because it increases and it strengthens one's heart and it makes you smarter it makes you more clever it gives you mental fortitude وَيَزِيدُ فِي الذَّكَاءِ he says it makes a person wiser and more cunning when he doesn't have to eat, he doesn't have to drink, he doesn't have to be a slave of his sexual desires. And he has ultimate self-control. He becomes wiser, he becomes smarter, he becomes a stronger human being. He says, Rahimahullah, whenever a person fasts, he becomes accustomed to eating a little and drinking a little. Think about when you break your fast. You've been fasting all day now. You're thirsty, you're hungry, but you don't even want to eat that much. You take some coffee, some tea, some dates, some water. You take some fresh fruit and your stomach is pretty much satisfied. An hour later, 30 minutes later, two hours later, perhaps you may desire a meal. But when you first initially break your fast, you're not that hungry anymore because your body is not accustomed to eating less and drinking less. What does the Quran and Sunnah say about eating too much? What does the Quran and Sunnah say about being a glutton? What does the Quran and Sunnah say about controlling one's button, one's stomach? And what happens to your health when you eat so much and you drink so much? How many diseases, sicknesses, illnesses, poisons come from the stomach? And that is why the ancient Arabs, the pagans, they says, إِنَّ الْمَعِدَةَ بَيْتُ Huh? That's not a hadith. They says that the stomach, the belly, is the household of illness. That's the cause of illness by people eating and drinking in such abundance. He says that when a person fasts, his desires are automatically tuned down. When a person fasts, he says the sins they have a, a less, huh, more narrow way of penetrating him. Min asliha. He says, and he enters upon good from each and every direction. He says in his good deed here, good deed there, good deed here, he's surrounded and enveloped by good deeds because he's fasting. What did the Sahaba do when they fasted? They would sit in the masjid. And what happened when they sat in the masjid? And an orphan wants sadaqah and someone wants charity. And you read the Quran and you lower your gaze and you turn off the television. He says you can't lose if you're fasting. وقال الحافظ السني رحمه الله تعالى فإنه لا مثل له في كسر الشهوة ودفع النفس العمارة والشيطان. He says this means there is not a tool which is stronger, more powerful, and more formidable in breaking the nafs and breaking shaitan's will and his influence upon you than fasting. Think about that now. There isn't a weapon in your arsenal that is more dangerous upon your two greatest enemies. The first enemy is someone that you know. Someone you look in the mirror every single day and that's your own self. Your own nafs. Al-nafs al-amaratu bisu. It's the soul that tells you to do bad. 
It commands you to do evil. You get whispers. You get ideas. You think about doing that which is wrong. Or even worse than that, some of us, we think about doing good. We think about giving charity. We think about going overseas and studying, but it says, I can't. And what about this? And how are they going to look at me? And that was just me just yesterday. I was on the block. I was doing this. I was taking rebel. I was shaving my beard. I was this. I was that. I can't be righteous now. I can't be the one who's teaching and leading the people now. I can't do these things. That's the nafs al amal of the soul. The, stuff that, the nafs that commands you to do evil. And most importantly or more dangerous is that it pulls you back from doing good. He says, so there isn't a weapon that you have which is stronger and sharper and more blunt and beating down this evil nafs than fasting. And the second enemy is the enemy that you may not be able to see. It's the enemy that you may not be able to recognize all of the time. And that's the enemy of the shaitan. And fasting is a major weapon against the shaitan. And destroying and leveling and stifling one's lower desires. That's the most important and the most orthodox interpretation of this hadith. The last thing that I want to share with you is another interpretation of this hadith. And another understanding of these prophetic words. He says, or he says that the Prophet ﷺ, he meant by this hadith, عَلَيْكَ بِالصَّوْمِ يَعْنِي عَلَيْكَ بِالْكَفِّ عَلَيْكَ بِالْإِمْسَاكِ عَلَيْكَ بِضَبْتِ النَّفْسِ Self-control. That's what he means by fasting. Because self-control is the key towards taqwa. And that is the whole entire concept of taqwa. And what does Allah say? إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْخَقُمْ The most excellent from among you are those who have the most taqwa. And taqwa and self-control, they go hand in hand. Hand in hand, taqwa and self-control. And whenever people make sins, it's because they lose control. They no longer control their nafs. And anything that you wish to do in this worldly life, when we talk to our children, you want to be a basketball player, son? I understand. Who wants to sit in a masjid? Who wants to be a scholar and a teacher? Who wants to be an imam? That's boring. I can't make no money. It's problems. It's not fun. I want to play basketball. Hmm? It's a reality. This is a reality. So you tell yourself, or you tell your son, okay, son, no problem. You want to be a basketball player? But what is your work ethic? How many hours do you practice? How much tape or footage do you watch of the NBA? Do you have enough self-control to be a basketball player? What do you want to do when you get money? You get drafted, you get paid. Where's your money going to go? But if you had taqwa, and if you're a pious, righteous Muslim, then you can be whatever you want to be. And that's because Muslims are supposed to have self-control. أَقُلُوا مَا سَمِتُمْ وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ تَعَلَى لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ وَسُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ يَعْمَا يَصِفُونَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى الْمُسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَب